So here's the part where I set up the review and try to explain a few things ahead of time. Now most people outright hated this movie. I myself did not. I liked the movie, I understood why some people wouldn't like it, I did not understand why people disliked it as much as they did. But apparently, some people seemed to assume that because I didn't hate this movie, that must mean I loved it, and now I'm making it my life's mission to correct those who didn't think it was great. This could not be further from the truth. This is no crusade on my part. I don't think any great injustice has been done by the fact that people didn't like this movie, nor do I think the film's detractors are entirely without a few valid points. This isn't like arguing that The Dark Knight was shit. Critics of ASM 2 at least have two functioning legs to stand on. To be perfectly frank, it wasn't that good. It does have a lot of problems and could have been a lot better if they were fixed. And even if the problems were ironed out, the film still wouldn't have been great, it just would have been better. I just think it holds up better than most people think, despite the flaws. Like I said in another video, I didn't think it was the best superhero film ever, or the best Spider-Man film ever, or even the best of the four superhero films that came out that year. Although I do have to say, it wasn't the worst superhero film to come out that year either. It came close, but no, that honor goes to the profusely stupid, torturously boring, vacuous character-laden, and terribly written Guardians of the Galaxy. I know many would say that that was the best superhero film to come out that year, but this is my show and I didn't like that movie! God, somebody kick his ass! Still, I thought The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was good. So the common question raised over my not hating ASM 2 runs something like this. Matthew, you criticized Spider-Man 3 heavily for having too many villains and story threads, so how is The Amazing Spider-Man 2 any different? Well, I still insist that The Amazing Spider-Man 2 only had one villain. The stupid Rhino guy doesn't show up until the tail end of the film, and this movie focused on developing Harry Osborn before he became the villain, again, at the tail end of the film. So the only constant villain it actually has is Electro. But as to how this film is different from Spider-Man 3? I don't know. Spider-Man 3 was a long time ago. That was like my fourth review or something. I haven't watched that movie since. Hang on, let me check it out again. Oh, what is that? What is that? What is that? What is that? Help! I remember now! And to answer your question, I will now present the difference between The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and Spider-Man 3 with the following montage. I promised him that I would keep away from you. And now I'm, I'm gonna come and eat dinner with your family. How can I do this? What does that, what does this make me? And no offense, but you're wrong. You're wrong about us being on different paths. We're not on different paths, you're my path. And you're always gonna be my path. Sorry, I love you. Don't hate me. Peter! Now dig on this. That's the difference. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was not an embarrassment. You can watch the movie with a certain sense of dignity, and when the movie's over, you might be able to say, Uh, I didn't like that movie and then turn it off and never think about it again. But you don't have to watch it all by yourself in a dark room with your coat pulled up over your face and just pray to God no one sees what you're watching. But that's just the tonal stuff. What you guys really want to know is how it differs in having too many plot threads. Well, I would put it like this. The Amazing Spider-Man 2's problem is that there was too much going on in it. Spider-Man 3's problem is that there was too much shit in the film, but not enough going on in it. Spider-Man 3 was basically, okay, so we have Harry Osborn trying to take revenge on Peter, and then, oh, never mind, because we also need the Sandman in here, so let's give Harry a convenient wang on the head so we can have amnesia and get out of the story for a little while. So now Peter is tracking down the Sandman because fuck the point of the first movie, we need to have Uncle Ben's death origins be different so this can all work. 
So now they both fight and, oh, hang on, let's bring Harry conveniently back in so that, oh, never mind again, because we also need Peter strutting around like a dumbass in the Venom suit, so get rid of Harry again, bring Sam back in and just... Wait, what were we talking about again? None of Spider-Man 3's plot threads had anything to do with one another. There were three separate story goals that they were trying badly to achieve at the same time, and none of them related. By contrast, every part of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, good or bad, has something to do with either the film's story or the film's theme, and it has something to do with one of those two things through the whole film. But now on to issue number two. I am constantly taking Marvel to task for doing things like this. That is, making films as mere launch vehicles rather than, you know, actual films. I don't deny that Sony was using ASM2 as a launch vehicle any more than Sony denies that they were doing this. So the question now becomes, why did I have such a problem when, say, Iron Man 2 did this, but I didn't have a problem with it here? Well, let me answer your question with a question. Where did they do this in the film except the tail end of it? This is not like Iron Man 2 where the actual film was carved out like a jack-o'-lantern to have stupid eye patch guy sitting there, unannounced, talking to Tony Stark about things that have nothing to do with the film we actually paid to see. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 waited until the story was done before having this stupid guy come out in a dumb-looking power armor suit, only to open the armor up for no reason just to shout, Did you get that, kids? That he's the Rhino? So you know what toys to buy when you get out of here? And if they had done this kind of shit in the middle of the film while putting the actual film on the back burner, we would be having a very different conversation right now. But they didn't. They did this at the end, after the story was already done. I mean, they shouldn't have done it at all, but they at least had the decency not to waste our time with this shit while we're trying to watch a movie, unlike almost everything Marvel has ever done. Yes, they showed us some of the future villains' weaponry at the tail end of the film. They did not call timeout in the middle of the film to show us Scarlett Johansson's ass. So yes, there are extreme differences between this and other films of its kind that I've criticized. In fact, as far as launch vehicle films are concerned, I think The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was actually the least offensive. At least they let me watch the movie this time before peddling all this unnecessary shit. But of course, these are just comparisons. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 can be less offensive than Iron Man 2 and Spider-Man 3 all day long. That wouldn't make the movie great. And it isn't great. But despite the flaws, I still think it's good. So stay tuned for the review, where I will explain why.